Good morning. Welcome to the Texas Restaurant Revival. Sounds like a religious ceremony on a Sunday morning, not a restaurant show. Uh, it's great to see everybody. We missed you last year. This is a lot better than Zoom. You know, we talk about the restaurant industry revival. Most of the restaurants I work with have already revived. We're past revival. And if you're not in a central business district or reliant on a lot of catering, uh, your revenue is 115 to 125% of what it was two years ago. If that's not the case, see me after this talk. And uh, it's really, really exciting right now. Sure, we've got our challenges. I do not have 40 general managers behind the curtain that you can interview at the end of this session. I do not have 2,000 staff members behind the curtain that you can introduce after this session. And I can't make a pig or a cow quickly enough to bring the prices down. Um, but I can talk about what we learned last year and how we are putting that to work now to make our restaurants better. I had a dinner. Uh, the night that we all applied for our RRF money, and I put that form in the machine and just waiting for the cash to come back before we even knew all the politics that were going to come into play and all the problems we were going to have with that program. And it was a dinner for my restaurant survival and success club members who are a bunch of multi-unit restaurant owners who work together on Zoom through the entire pandemic to figure out how to get through that. And it just so happened that was the night we had our dinner, the first time this group had came together. And people were walking around in a daze. People were just, they, one guy said, I feel like I'm on the seesaw. I was at the bottom of the seesaw, and I've been living this survival route for a year. And now I'm at the top of the seesaw. My restaurants are full. The government's sending me all this money. Literally, they, they were like almost disconnected from reality, walking around this private dining room in Dallas, going, what happened? What happened? How did this happen to, for us? And if you remember, uh, if you're old enough to remember a bumper sticker that we used to see around Texas, what the bumper sticker said, Lord, just give me one more oil boom and I promise not to screw it up. Does anybody remember that? Well, this is our oil boom. We're here. And we're here to talk to each other about how we're not going to screw it up. So, you know, here we are. Oh, they took, my, they took my title down. I'm still standing, but the pandemic kicked my restaurant's ass. So what about that oil boom? Well, you know, that same, just like the people that come out of the oil busts, we've come out of our bust, and we have to be really smart about taking advantage of our boom. Now, I'm reading something lately about animals not having true memory. So. Animals that can access things that have happened in the past, but they don't have true memory. Then if you're walking your dog, your dog's not thinking, you know, the best walk we ever had was three years ago when we went to the park. Your dog's just reacting to stimuli. Now, there may be some animal lovers in here that dispute that. Uh, anybody want to talk about that now? I'm open. I don't know the hell a lot about animals. But that's where humans are different. We remember. We have memories. And what happens in good times is you tend to forget what you learned in the bad times. That's the oil boom bumper sticker. Uh, and we are all real busy right now. We're super busy just trying to keep our restaurants going, trying to find staff, trying to understand commodity prices and how that's going to affect our menus. And there's a risk that we could forget everything we learned last year and just keep going. And that would be a huge tragedy and a big lost cause that we don't want to happen. So what the next few minutes is about is listening to the things that you learned in the pandemic that other people in this room can profit from, that you're remembering now, that you're acting on now, so that we do take the greatest advantage of this boom. And those of you that follow me know I'm all about post-pandemic opportunity to dominate your segment. Because not everybody's going to be paying attention. And sadly, there are some people that are gone. So we're going to get right into it. Jennifer has a microphone. She's at the back. And we want to share some stories about your operation. And for those of you that are 
our associates that work with restaurateurs, what your biggest lessons have been from that horrible year you lived through last year. Who, who was brave and wants to go first? Okay, Jennifer, up here. I think it has to be turned on. No? They're coming, they're coming to help you. Oh, there we go. Very good, thanks. Um, Marilyn. I would say uh, one of the, the biggest things, at least, at the beginning of the pandemic that we learned is how um, to rely on our community where, where we're at, we're a small restaurant. And the, the very first thing that we did is really engaged with the public through our social media and to really start to um, rely on that to really get the word out, you know, what's going on, being transparent that, you know, we were going through hard times, but you know, we were surprised at the amount of support just from our community and being able to, you know, deliver food to hospitals. And people were, you know, really, um, I think, engaged with us through that. And and I think that that was one of the biggest um, wins for us was really relying on that social media community to really generate business. And 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 to stay um, engaged with with all of our with all of our you know followers, um, and that's that really helped a lot for us to generate business. So that's one of the things that we'll continue to do, is really stay um, on top of like technology and engaging the public and relying on on them to uh, you know generate business because it's now a lot of that's how a lot of people learn things now is it through social media. So right. so we've we've really we've really relied on that heavily. That's such a huge learning. I think that most of us never really stopped and thought about how much our guests loved our restaurants before. Right? We're so so much in the moment of, of getting through the week, getting through the accounting period, getting through the quarter, getting through the year, that it was only when those restaurants got taken away that our guests got to have that bond with us because they really missed us and they wanted to be with us and they were really tired of that frozen food that they had the picking up curbside at the grocery store and thawing every night for dinner. So I think what Marilyn's saying is that was a real light bulb for her that you can leverage that forever. You can understand how much your guests love you and if you can connect with them through social then in good times and bad, they're not gonna forget how much they love you. And I think a real example of that is right now, okay, we opened up, uh, we didn't have staff, guests were pissed off, you know, two months ago. And even though I'm reading a lot, there's a lot in the national media right now that's, it's, you know, typical stories of really angry restaurant guests. Uh, there was a thing I read this morning on my phone about tourists in Maui cursing out people at the beaches. But that's not what my clients are experiencing right now. My clients are experiencing something totally different, that they're, they're starting to get it. They understand the staff shortage is not just us. It's construction. It's landscaping. It's, it's, it's even the grocery stores are short staffed. So the guest is now more forgiving again. And I hope that you're experiencing that in your dining rooms, whereas they were not understanding why the Section 100 was closed two months ago. Now they're like, okay, we get it. We get it. So, Marilyn, thank you for that. Who else has a story? Right back here, Jennifer. Thank you. No, no. Oh, Rose? Oh, sure. We'll get to you next. Rose. Um, I think after we all freaked out um, that uh, for us, our customer base was gone because we're in close proximity to downtown Dallas, the convention center, hotels, um, that once we freaked out over, our customer base is gone. What are we going to do? Uh, we were able to stop and realize, or let's say our community helped us to realize, that 
there were people out there that were still very active. Right. There were manufacturers that were churning 24 hours that suddenly wanted to feed their employees. And so then you started thinking about, okay, where else do I go for this? So I think that everybody was not experiencing a slowdown in business. There were businesses that were booming, and you just had to identify them and go after them. Right. Thank you for that. So that's called uh, creative marketing, and that is true. I mean, that's something a lot of people experienced last year. Uh, for Rose, God bless Rose and the brothers and sisters in her position, uh, central business district, adjacent to a central business district in a residential neighborhood. Um, and a lot of that was gone. But logistics was hot. We knew where, where were our employees were going. Our employees were going to logistics. So we pivoted our catering to logistics. They've got to eat too. And we may never have had those people before as a customer. So a social, a catering salesperson that was doing a social spend or a corporate spend pivoted to, OK, the people at the warehouse, have, they've got to eat. They don't have time to leave. They're so busy fulfilling orders. So that was a pivot. And once again, one plus one equals three. If you can keep that now that when your other catering comes back and still do your work with logistics people that you didn't have before, then you've got revenue increase. That's the kind of thing we're looking at. So thank you for that. Yes. There were two things that stood out for me as a consumer. It, one of them was the delivery services, and that's not to slam any of them, but the amount, the percentage that they took. Some of my favorite restaurant people helped me understand who was taking a smaller slice of their pie, so I was encouraged to use those or order direct. So I didn't find that out until I hit the social media <laughs> part. So that made a big difference to me because I wanted more dollars in my favorite restaurant's right. pockets. The second thing was the number of restaurants that were doing philanthropic food for the people who were giving the vaccines, who were doing the, we had a crew of people that went to go eat in that physical restaurant with a, well, we'll just say a multiple percentage tip because we were grateful for what they did. So your philanthropy does not go unnoticed. Right, thank you for that. Yeah, I think that's true. I think one of the big awarenesses, one of the big consumer awarenesses during the pandemic was what we already knew. The third party delivery services were designed to create some marginal profit for a restaurant that was already successful in making money and had its overhead covered. The third party delivery services were never designed to be your business when you had a brick and mortar restaurant on Main and Main with a dining room and a parking lot. So the guest has been informed now. And you talk to guests, they know. A part of that's what we've done to communicate, going back to social media. Please order from us. What we did to create our own interfaces on our website. And let me tell you, there are still some restaurants, talking about learning from the pandemic, I still see restaurants where I go to their website and I can't order online directly from them, still. And if any of those people are sitting in this room or people you know that you don't want to tell me about right now, you've got to change that. You've got to let the guest order from you. You've got to own your customer data. You've got to know who you, how to communicate with these people and what they're eating. So that was a huge, huge awareness. Um, and it will never go back. There is now a guest that says, well, I do want the convenience, but I don't want to take the money out of the restaurant's pocket. And even if that's 10% or 15% of those delivery guests, that's a huge number. Uh, and one other thing we learned is we could negotiate with these people, right? When they came down and you signed up and it was like, okay, it's gonna be a little bit of business and we'll take 30% and you'll make 20%, you're yeah, that fine. Now you're living on this and you're thinking, wow, this is crazy. We've gotta renegotiate this. I mean, I renegotiated one of my clients on their third party deliveries and we saved $120,000 a year by negotiating the percentage down. Now, you, everybody can't do that, but you can when you get to a good enough volume. So third party delivery was, you know, it was a lifeline and it was a death knell at the same time. And we learned that we have to perfect our online ordering, our curbside, the whole experience, because nobody wants to call your restaurant anymore and, and give you their order, nobody. 
uh, the highest new adoption of technology was in the 55 up age group. Nobody. So you got to have that handled. So thanks for that. Great. Other thoughts and comments from what was learned? Trent. So I've got uh, two things. Uh, the first one that we really took a hard look at was how can we create more perceived value, both for our guests and our team members. Um, team members probably more so than anything, because when our purse strings were tied shut, we had to figure out ways to create benefits that created more value for them than we had to put into it so that they uh, hung around with us longer and came out of it. And when, as we've come out of things, would tell their friends, oh man, even like at the height of the pandemic, they were paying for my gym membership, right. doing all this cool stuff. Um, and those are things that cost a lot less than a $3 an hour raise. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. The second one for us was we've really operated out of a so what, now what mentality the last year of, you know, if you want to go lose weight and you're having trouble doing it, work out harder. Right. Diet harder. If you, if you want to be more profitable, work harder. And, and that's really what we've been living by is that there's, there's no excuses. We, that are, we, are, we used to have a hashtag, no excuses, that we would share with our team. But it's really, if you want to get the work done, get it done. We, we had general managers that were devoting maybe an hour a week to interviewing. Now we've got a, a home office team member that, that's dedicating 50 hours a week to interviewing so that when someone applies, they get a phone call within five minutes so that they know that they are, they're wanted and that we desire to speak with them. Nice. And ideally, we can stodge them at the restaurant that day and give them an offer they can't refuse because if we give them 10 minutes, someone else will call them. Right. Thank you, Trent. You gave us a lot there. I really appreciate it. I see a lot of heads being nodded right there. First of all, one of our brilliant predictions we had was the economy was going to go bad, so we'd have all the workers we needed, right? Remember that brilliant prediction we all shared in our delusion? Uh, so what I think Trent's talking about boils down to culture. And culture used to be a nice thing to have. Um, and now, uh, not only through the pandemic, but throughout the evolution of the, of the American worker, and especially our younger workers, if you, if you don't have your culture right, you're never going to make it. Uh, and culture used to be something for the employees, and now it's really we're marketing to the guests the same way we're marketing to the employees through culture. So what Trent's talking about is being more sensitive to his employees and also having a more aggressive attitude towards getting things done, kind of as a cocktail, which is really nice. And if you can't tell me in seven or eight words what your culture is about in a way that everybody that works in your company can repeat back to you, and live every day, and if you don't have a way of measuring that every day on every shift, you're going to continue to struggle to attract the workers that are out there, to retain the workers you have, to bring in a guest that wants to know more about what your, your restaurant stands for than what you serve. And all those things Trent talked about, flexible, generous, employee-focused, are really part of that combination that is now a permanent combination, and when we go come back next year and we talk about how we're going to bring these workers back to the industry that have left, uh, that's going to be a big part of that conversation. So Trent, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Up oh, there, we go. Other thoughts? I know you got more. If, you know, I'm going to start calling on people. I'm warning you right now. <laughs> Anybody got any, any more volunteers before we? We start drafting. Right here, James. So what we discovered is uh, that we had to kind of change our, our perception of doing business. And we kind of made like a hybrid model. So that way we're doing our, you know, we're back to dining. So we're doing, focusing a lot on that. But we're also keeping, so we did a, a grocery store during oh. the main closure. So we are still doing that grocery store. We're still doing third-party delivery. We're still having uh, a lot more technology in, in, integrated into our business. And so we're really focusing on just keeping that hybrid of accessibility to our customers in whatever method that they feel most comfortable with. And so that really is what um, I, we learned the most from is just being accessible all the time in any way possible. And it's, it's a little tough sometimes yeah. to keep up with it. But I feel like it's most important is to keep those customers engaged and knowing that they want to come and see you all the time. Thank you, James. 
And then I was in a restaurant in Colorado a few weeks ago that changed one of their dining rooms into a grocery store. And they still, just like you, they still have got it. And I think one of the biggest pieces of learning from that is we're still in the curbside business. We're still in the delivery business. We're still doing this to go. And some of our restaurants were always doing to go, but some weren't. And what we've learned is there's a guest that wants that. This is not going away, folks. They, we've, we've almost trained them to want that. Now, sure, there's an occasion when you want to be in the dining room and see across your, the, your dining room and see your friends and your neighbors and other people. But there's now also a bigger occasion when you want to be at home in, in your slippers and your pajamas and your table eating food that's better than you can cook uh, from a convenience standpoint. And there's another guest. Now, we're at a trade show. OK, this is like we've just gone to Mars. Uh, this is one of the first trade shows in the country out of the gate. I'm sure there's a lot of people that thought, uh, uh, no, not this year. I'm going to wait a year, uh, or maybe five years, or 10, or 15, or 20. I don't know. Uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting getting back into being around, being around this many people in a, in a restaurant environment. So I sat at a, at a bar. Uh, it's not an alcoholic bar, because this is a story about my nine-year-old. OK, let's get that straight. A bar around a pizza oven on Friday night in Dallas with my nine-year-old. We like to watch the pizza makers cooking the pizzas. And then I thought, this is weird. We're like three feet away from strangers, and they're breathing on us. Is this OK? Uh, so there's another guest out there that you, that you have probably don't think about. And that's the guest that's just now saying, I'm going to order to-go food. For a year, they've been afraid because they misunderstood that COVID can be, is a foodborne illness that can be carried on food, as much as we try to communicate that. So this guest is just now going, OK, curbside. Now, what is that, 5%, 7%? We don't know. But that 5% or 7%, that's a lot of money. So here's one th way you can evaluate how you're doing. If your to-go delivery curbside is back down to what it was pre-pandemic, you have a problem. It should not be going all the way back down. Remember, one plus one equals three. You should have at least uh, 10 points higher in to-go delivery and curbside now than you had pre-pandemic. And that's how we're getting to these 115%, 125% revenues that we're experiencing. We've got our dining room busy, and we've got a curbside business that we never had, which goes back to what James said. How does the guest want to access us? Don't ever forget that. It's going to change in our careers. And for so long, we were like, OK, this is what we do, and this is the number of seats we have, and this is when we're open. Would you like to take one of those seats, either through a reservation or by waiting? And the guest is now saying, well, there's some other things that we'd like to do. And many of us in the past would go, no. And we've learned through the period of survival that we've come out of this incredible lesson that James articulated so well. And here's the whole idea of this session. Don't ever forget that. Don't wake up in two years and forget about how the guest wants to access you, because the guest decides. Ultimately, the guest decides. You don't decide. So if that can open up your creativity for things that are coming in the future that we don't even know about yet. That's going to really, really serve the rest of your, you the rest of your career. So James, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Jennifer, where did Jennifer go? Okay, learn to say yes. That's a really good point. You know, when you have no money, and it's the other guy's money, and you care about the other people, and they, you're a lot more likely to be flexible. Uh, so to stay that way. And those of us that are not naturally flexible, anyone not naturally flexible like me, I'm the only one, of course. Oh, I got his friend. We've had to learn, man. We've had to pivot. I had to pivot my whole business from growing companies to saving companies. And I'm glad to be back to growing companies, but saving companies was a, a, one of the most rewarding things I've ever done because it helped so many people. So I had that too. Other le lessons we learned. John. I don't know if 
if, if this is going to be so much a lesson as it is just kind of a mindset of, of what we had to, to get into in order to, to uh, keep our employees, keep our, our, our company uh, in, in, in the culture and the, the attitudes and the, the, the feelings of uncertainty about we don't know where this is going and um, all, all of that kind of in one. You know, when the situation started, we immediately just went to work. We went, we rolled our sleeves up. We said, well, this sucks, but let's, let's make something happen. And we started to put together creativity where where we could. And one of the ways uh, that that in a restaurant business, I think everybody can relate to this. But you have you know people who are, are constantly coming in and sharing different things with you. And right before this this restaurant situation, we had a mariachi uh, group that uh, was introduced to us through a contact. And we're sitting there one day, and uh, it's my coworker's birthday at his off at my office, and I, I work at a corporate office as well. And uh, so I said, Jose, let's put something together real quick. Let's, let's make it uh, kind of safe, right? Because it's in the pandemic. We're going to take food out to the house. We're going to call these mariachi guys to come with us. And we're going to put together like a little package for this that we could market safely on the curbside, delivering food, having mariachis playing music as they were delivering the food. And it was a huge hit. And it was just something that it was just, you know, here's guys, mariachi guys who aren't having any business right now and before had tons of business. We're in this similar situation where we don't have a lot of business right now because, you know, 60% of our foot traffic just ended because we, we closed our dining. Right. And this was just a creative way to take a problem and, and you know, take lemons and make lemonade. Right. Uh, and it, it worked tremendously for us. Uh, we did hundreds of these. Uh, and, and we still... So, so now it, it's almost, it's almost work too much because now people will call us and be like, yeah, yeah, uh, we're not really wanting food, but do you guys have the mariachis? I'm like, that's not the point. <laughs> You're missing the point. Thanks, John. So let me, let me address what John said because I have a strong feeling about that, and that's a really great story. And uh, maybe you can have a mariachi rental company on the side. There you go. There's always a call for them. So here's one thing I think we don't think about a lot, and that's the... The amount of confidence that we now have that we didn't have, you know, March 1st of last year because of the things we've done. So I don't want you to sell yourself short on that. You got through this. You did all these crazy things. You kept your, your business going. You encouraged your employees. You re reached out to your guests. You pivoted. You pivoted again. You, you really got through what is going to be in the history books as the toughest time in our industry for 100 years, right? So you have an opportunity to do things differently. You can either go, well, that's over. I'm glad. Boy, am I glad it's like it used to be, which, by the way, it's never going to be like it used to be. Or you can reflect on the amount of personal power you have to get through that. I mean, it was a high calling. It was really tough. There were a lot of difficult conversations. But if you can reflect on what you achieved and it, during that time. And that's true for everybody, not just for restaurateurs, um, but more, probably more so for restaurateurs because of what we've been through. Uh, with the kind of confidence you now have, you've seen what your personal power is capable of, what can you do with that going forward now that you have all this revenue? Don't relax. Tap into that power that you showed yourself. Maybe a lot of, you know, I had a call with so many restaurateurs, people owning hundreds of restaurants and in March of last year, and every one of them had considered the fact that their business was gone. Gone. One guy said to me, I can't believe what I've worked 17 years to build could be gone in a week. And of course, it didn't work out that way. In fact, that particular person ended up really doing pretty well during the pandemic of all people. But my point is, you know, John and his mariachis. Well, what's, that, what's the equivalent of that now? If you're not tapping into that power and confidence that you learned and the capability that you have during the pandemic, during the restaurant crisis portion of the pandemic, you're selling yourself short now. So think about that. We have a few more minutes, and I want to see who else has a comment about what they learned. And it's getting a little noisy in here, but. We're, we're making it happen. Thank you. Um, my name is Israel. I own a restaurant in New Braunfels called Las Fontanas. And um, i tell you what we didn't do. I was scared to death. Two weeks leading into the shutdown, 
um, we were we fully staffed, and you know Friday night we would sell twenty percent of what we typically would sell. It was very nerve wracking, but we did not shut down the the store one one day. Right. I know we had to shut the dining room, but we never shut one day. Another thing that I saw other restaurants were doing that we didn't do was close on Mondays. That brought in all the business towards my restaurant on Mondays, which we didn't close. Um, and, and unfortunately, we saw restaurants go down uh, one by one. Another thing that we didn't do that we saw the restaurants doing was cut down our menu. I thought that was a terrible idea, to be honest, is uh, because we're, we still wanted to be there for the customers and what they wanted and uh, we kept the whole menu and um, and volunteers to work because we lost 70% of our work staff because they were scared and um, so that that's all I really wanted to share with y'all okay thank you do. so I think what Israel is talking about is the overreaction and how much that costs in the long run and that's another I think really big piece of learning from the last year so for instance, I've got people now that I'm looking at, they're still on COVID hours, or they're, should we open or earlier? Should we go back on Mondays? Well, you know, the last thing you ever want is a guest to park their car, get out of their car, walk to your front door, pull the handle, and it doesn't open, right? That's not really a good thing. Going back especially to the first comment that Marilyn had about guest relations because they're going to go somewhere else. And here's a secret. They might like that other restaurant they go to and not come back to yours. So it's really important not to overreact in the last year. We were operating out of a lot of fear, especially at the beginning. We didn't know. I mean, I have seen multi-unit companies. They cut their area directors to save money, which seemed like a good idea at the time. And now that they're back open, the areas where they cut the area directors are their lowest performing areas. Okay, well, why is that? Because an area director that's any good pays for themselves, period. It doesn't cost you money, it makes you money. So I think that's an, another really good piece that Israel pointed out is when do you overreact? When to react? When do you overreact? When are you acting out of good business principles? When are you acting out of fear? And once again, as we go forward for our careers, for the rest of our lives, if we can distinguish between smart action and overreaction, we're going to be a whole lot more successful. So thank you for that. And congratulations for being strong and that you're still standing. We have time for just a couple more. Who's got something on their mind? They really want to say it. They're not sure if they should raise their hand. We got one. Make sure you speak into the mic. Again. I can speak into the mic. Um, I just, I have a comment, just an appreciative comment. Um, I am, uh, I have a restaurant out in West Texas, um, very remote. I'm all by myself out there. I've been running a restaurant on my own, learning on my own, and you can imagine how uh, many hills and valleys there are on that. Um, so when this all hit, the worst day of my life, and I had to tell all my staff, sorry guys, we're going to have to take a little break here. I was all alone. And about that time is when I found TRA. And I had Dr. Knight coming in every night, uh, either with a video or a good email, telling me I'm not all alone, that y'all are all out there and we're all going through the same thing and giving me information that I needed to have the, the knowledge uh, to go forward and to keep my keep my um, staff uh, close by and be able to reopen when we were able to. And as you alluded to, I just had my best spring ever. I'm and glad so for you. That's got to feel I good. I really appreciate Is this TRA. your first TRA show? That's my first TRA right, show. All right, very good. We gotta... <laughs> so thank you all. Nice. Well, that, you know, that really kind of brings everything full circle. And those of us that have been involved in the Restaurant Association for decades know that we have a really unique situation here where people who have competing restaurants across the street from each other help each other, which people look at me and they go, huh, how does that work exactly? 
So I do think that's an important point. We talked about the guest community. We have our community. And even those of us that have been really wired in and connected and participating over the years have always had this. But there's no question that this was a huge opportunity for the Restaurant Association to reach out and, and show value to people like you. And this is why we have these conversations. Like in my own business, I talked earlier about Restaurant Survival and Success Club. I never had that before. Uh, now I've got Restaurant Owner Success Club because we're out of survival, which is a great group that, that I have in my business and my community. So there's probably a lot of people around here today with stories like yours, and there will be even more. And that's, that's a really important thing. So I would encourage you, if you're not already involved in your local chapter, and there is a map of Texas, and there's not an inch of Texas that doesn't have a chapter. Some chapters are big and fancy, and some chapters are five or six people getting together for a beer. Uh, but get involved. Reach out to your friends and your, and co your people. Even if you think you're isolated, there's, your region's bigger, right? And realize that you, the Restaurant Association in Texas allows you to sit across from a competitor and help each other. And that is a really, really important thing. And you know, we were all scrambling as hard as we could during that time to get information to people like you, knowing that your business was in peril. So thanks for bringing that up. Appreciate it. OK. Any other comments or thoughts about what you learned last year that is critical? to your future. Any other? Do we have anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, over here. I just can't see your name from back there. OK, thank you. My name is Rodney. And uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out to Israel over there. He's got the best Tex-Mess restaurant in New Braunfels. Um, <laughs> but I do, I work with Foresight Commercial Real Estate, and I help a lot of restaurant owners with social media marketing. And so if this is a little off topic, I apologize. But I wanted to get your thoughts. You said something earlier about delivery and to go. If you're back to pre-pandemic levels, delivery to go curbside. If you're back to pre-pandemic levels, you're in trouble. Yes. And I'm kind of wondering if if you feel the same way about social media. I know a lot of mom and pops have trouble finding budget to to use social media, but I know during the pandemic, a lot of businesses found that found that as a lifeline. Right. What are your thoughts moving forward? Well, boy, that's a whole marketing question. I mean, let's face it. There were not a lot of people last year going. Well, let's see, my business is down 80%. I better increase my marketing budget. Uh, but that really is a good question for the future. What does marketing look like in the future? What's working for you? And um, I, th I think it's a restaurant by concept by concept proposition. Uh, going back to the first comment, you really know what works. If you don't know what works now, you have not been paying attention. Whether that's the personal relationships you have in your community, whether that's social, whether that's good old-fashioned email marketing. And I'm like, they still have email marketing? They still have that? Yeah, they still have that, and it works for a lot of people. Uh, or PR, or advertising, or whatever you do. Because if you didn't learn last year what works, because your budget was lower, the results were clearer, and we could spend a whole other hour on marketing, and maybe we'll do that next year. Uh, so I think what I would, where I would take that, Rodney, would be to say, think about what you learned about what worked. And I don't mean what worked to bring a guest into your dining room on a Friday at 6 o'clock. I mean what worked to keep your top line as healthy as it could be over a period of time. And do more of that now that you have the money. Don't think, well, I'm full. I still don't need to spend on marketing. Marketing is a 12-month out of the year proposition. It is not about, I, I don't even want to say the word. I'll say it, OK, butts and seats. Not about butts and seats. It's about building your brand over a long period of time so that you continue to prosper. You can grow your business, either the revenue in your existing units or more units. So I think that's a really a great place to end, end the, the, the uh, audience part of this on because that's another perfect example of a big learning last year that really isn't on our radar right now. Marketing. What did I learn in marketing? Why am I marketing? I can't serve the guests I have now. That's why you're marketing. This is not a permanent position, permanent condition. So those of us in the forecasting business, you know, uh, it's a little rough to be in the forecasting business because it's on paper and people can go back and see if you were right. 
So last year I did forecast that when this was over, we were going to have the highest sales in, that we've ever had. Uh, I just didn't know when. And I think for a lot of us, when we started, came into this year, before we even knew, were we, would we be at TRA this summer, you know, July? Would we be there in July? I don't know. I think most of us thought uh, third quarter, which is just about to start, which just started, excuse me, would be when things would start to pick up, and fourth quarter would be really great because, hey, it's fourth quarter. We kind of thought the vaccines would get it out in the summer because we had no personal knowledge of this and just read the newspaper. And that's kind of the way we acted. So we were getting ready for third quarter, and then second quarter happened, and the floodgates opened up, and we didn't have enough staff, and we had to deal with the price of commodities, and our guests were, like I said at the beginning, a little cranky, although they're really a lot better now, thankfully, uh, at least here in Texas. So we just got right into action. So let's do it, man. Like the mariachis, we just got to do this. And that collapsed our window to get ready. We were all getting ready for third quarter, and second quarter happened. And that's why we're having this talk today. Because we didn't have the chance to prepare for what we thought would be an orderly opening and a revenue increase. We are so busy right now uh, talking about how to keep our restaurants going. You know, I can't walk from the elevator in the hotel across the lobby without three people talking to me about what their staff shortage looks like or what they're paying for steak, right? That's what we're all about right now. So here, so the reason we had this talk today was because you missed the luxury of your planning period. The guests just came back. And in a way, that's good because we feel great. Our restaurants are busy. Our bank accounts are strong. Some people are actually in a better position now than they were pre-pandemic, which is how I ended up in that dining room I told you about at the beginning where people are walking around in a daze. Uh, so what I want you to reflect on from this conversation today is since you missed your planning period, what can you do to kind of get that back? Make time every week to think about what did I learn? How am I going to go forward? What am I never going to forget? When I get the guest, let the guest decide how to work with you. Keep reaching out to the people that support you. Don't give up on your crazy ideas. Be flexible when you need to be flexible. And keep connected to your restaurant association. Don't forget it, because the people that remember this and take advantage of it are the people that are going to dominate the restaurant business going forward. And the people that go just work on their restaurants today because they're busy <coughs> are going to be left behind. And I don't want anybody in this room to be left behind. So thank you for visiting today. Thank you for listening. And please circulate some of these concepts to your friends, your neighbors, the people in your local restaurant chapter. We're shooting video, so that tells me that this is going to be available. And put yourself in a position to look back and say that pandemic, as awful as it was, and I can't overplay how awful it really was when you think about the families that have lost loved ones, the disrupted economy, the people that still aren't back to work yet, but realize that there's two sides to every coin, and, and we can acknowledge the, the horrible things that happened in the last year, and we can still make it work for our businesses going forward. And I hope that you do that. For those of you that were not brave enough to raise your hand or want to ask me something, I'm going to stick around for a few minutes. There's a ton of great other education sessions here today and tomorrow. Please take advantage of them. And I just want to thank you once again, and I hope that you're amongst the group that take this information and dominate in the future. Thank you.